Well, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Sandy Deese, and I'm part of the Authors of Google program. And we are very excited to have Mark Danner here today. Um, just to give you a little history, um, that for like the past two decades, Mr. Danner has reported from Latin America, Haiti, the Balkans, and the Middle East. Um, his perceptive award-winning dispatches have not only explored the real consequences of American engagement with the world, but also the relationship between political violence and power. Now today, um, I got feedback from Googlers that they wanted um, the talk to be focused on um, ex torture and where we are when it comes to extreme interrogation with the Obama administration. So he'll be talking about his book, um, stripping bare of the body, but also he will focus his talk on that issue. Um, please remember, if you have any questions, to go to the to the uh, mic over there so that when it's on YouTube, people will hear the questions. And um, without further ado, here's Mr. Danner. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, thank you, Sandy. It's a pleasure to be at Google. Um, and thank you to Ann Farmer for inviting me. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, I thought I would talk today, uh, as Sandy mentioned, um, I've been out talking about my current book, which is called Stripping Bare the Body, Politics, Violence, War. This is Ann Farmer's copy. <laughs> um, I'm going to say a word, start by saying a word about the, the title, um, and then um, we'll talk a little bit about one aspect of the book, which is uh, about torture um, and the Bush administration and now the Obama administration, um, and then would love to take questions uh, on whatever subject. I've written about Haiti, Iraq, uh, the war on terror. Uh, a lot on torture for the last six years. Uh, the book is called Stripping Bare the Body, as I said, which comes from a quotation uh, from a former Haitian president, Leslie Moniga. He's a very interesting guy, intellectual, political exile, um, a supporter of Duvalier, the Haitian dictator, autocrat. Um, and he told me in an interview, he served as president for about five months before he was overthrown in a military coup. Uh, as many Haitian presidents are. And um, he told me uh, in an interview in which we were talking about my preoccupations, what I like to write about, he said, political violence is like stripping bare the social body. The better to place the stethoscope and hear the real life beneath the skin. Um, according to this view, which I share, if you really want to understand a society, if you want to see what makes it tick, uh, the forces that are raging beneath the surface, who's up, who's down, who has power, who's trying to get power, what its real values are, then look at that society during a time of stress, a time of violence, a time of revolution, uh, coup d'etat, uh, civil war. Uh, look at that society in the months and years after it's been attacked uh, by terrorists, for example. So this book essentially is a kind of compendium of what Moniga calls moments, these moments of nudity in his phrase. Um, it begins uh, with a long section, reporting section, reporting on the ground uh, from Haiti, uh, in which it describes the chaos after the fall of Duvalier and the attempt to build a democracy in Haiti, an attempt that is still going on, that led to all sorts of dislocations, violence, uh, political instability. Uh, that's the section that's really about the late Cold War. Uh, it goes on then to a substantial section reporting on the Balkan Wars uh, of the early 90s. We knew that era at the time as the post-Cold War world, a very weird name. It's like calling you know, non-fiction, calling something by what it's not. Um, as we look back on it now, uh, even though at the time um, uh, people were talking about the end of history, the Cold War is over, uh, we've now reached a nirvana of democracy and capitalism. But as we look back on that period now, we might just as well call it the age of genocide, because there were two large genocides, one in the Balkans, uh, one in Rwanda, uh, in which the West, self-described West, basically looked on and, and did nothing and watched it on television, watched both of them on television. 
Um, and finally, the last part is about Iraq and the war on terror. Uh, and it, there's a good deal of reporting uh, from the Iraq war on the ground, from Fallujah, from Baghdad, um, particularly later parts of the war. Um, a good deal of reporting about the U.S. during the war on terror. And finally, and this is what I'd like to talk to you about today, um, a lot of writing on torture. Um, the writing on torture is under the general category, what I call the state of exception. Um, what is the state of exception? It's a broad term under which you could group martial law, state of emergency, state of siege. And uh, it really indicates that we're living in a kind of separate time now, uh, soft martial law, if you will, uh, that was declared in the days and weeks after the 9-11 attacks and that we still have not exited from. Uh, it's not just the war on terror itself, but the sets of laws and changes in the law that the Bush administration introduced uh, to uh, essentially build a different governing consensus on issues like uh, wiretapping. Uh, right now, the government can essentially tap your phone calls and read your emails. It's a complicated issue, of course, but they can do it without uh, uh, court approval. Um, and uh, that was begun under the Bush administration. It continues under uh, the Obama administration. Uh, extraordinary rendition is another aspect of the state of exception in which uh, people are picked up off the street in foreign countries, kidnapped, taken to a series of so-called black sites, secret prisons around the world where they're interrogated um, and sometimes tortured, and then just the general issue of, of torture itself and harsh interrogation. Um, uh, torture is a long story, of course. It began in the days and weeks after 9-11. Um, it is with us still. It's interesting, deeply interesting from my point of view, because I've been covering it as a journalist now for six or seven years. Uh, I published a book in 2004 called Torture and Truth, which essentially, I mean, from Google's point of view, I guess it's kind of a retrograde book because it consisted of uh, two-thirds of it, about 400 pages, consisted of government documents, uh, which I published, and which were released in the wake of the Abu Ghraib scandal. You'll all remember those photographs, which told in very great detail the story of how the U.S., after 9-11, made the decision to torture detainees or to use extreme interrogation, which is the preferred term of the Bush administration, the Republican Party, uh, how those decisions were made, how the program was developed, how the protocol of exact, how the interrogation was done was developed within the CIA and also the Defense Department, um, how it was approved by the Department of Justice, uh, what those legal documents were, and I published them in that book, that declared that torture was legal. Um, and this goes back to 2004, the first large, large-scale piece on torture uh, was published in the Washington Post in December 2002, um, followed by, that was about 4,000 to 5,000 words, front page, followed a couple of months later by a piece equally long in the New York Times. So one of the strange things about the torture story from the beginning is that there is the story of what happened, that is, how this protocol was developed, who was interrogated in this way, what the CIA did, what the Department of Defense did, what the Department of Justice did, all these things which we know a lot about. And there's a parallel narrative, uh, and that parallel narrative is what we knew about it. And the fact is, though, as a journalist and a writer, I fall easily into the kind of rhetoric of disclosure. When was this disclosed? When was the revelation? When did it happen? In fact, we have known the better part of this story for a half dozen years. Uh, and it's one of the peculiar things, which I call in the book, the frozen scandal, the notion that what I believe certainly to be wrongdoing uh, is made public. Uh, it is generally acknowledged by most people to have happened, and yet it continues. Uh, I grew up, uh, or at least came to political consciousness in the Watergate period, when you had a kind of sequence of uh, events uh, that defined a scandal. First you'd have revelation, usually by the press, often by a leak in the press. Next you'd have investigation, uh, societal investigation by uh, the Congress, uh, by the courts sometimes, but an investigation that would give you a story of what happened that society could agree on. And finally you'd have expiation, 
people would be prosecuted, they'd lose their jobs, they'd be punished in some way, the society would return to some kind of what might be called a state of grace, I guess. Um, and this, one of the things it seems to me that characterizes our age, uh, the age of the war on terror, um, is that process, that threefold process, or three-part process, uh, has been derailed. We're stuck between revelation and true investigation, and that's where we are with torture. Torture has become, has gone from being an anathema, as it was before the war on terror, to being essentially a policy choice, um, and also to being a political football. I brought along yesterday's copy of the New York Times, hard copy, uh, the front page, Group's Attack on Justice Department Lawyers Divides Conservatives. Did anybody see this, this piece? Very interesting piece, essentially about the fact that you have this Republican political group that has now demanded the names of what it calls the terrorist, terrorist lawyers, um, the Al-Qaeda 7 is the other phrase, which are the lawyers within, supposedly within the Obama Justice Department that have represented detainees in court. Uh, so this has now become a permanent part of our political system, the argument over torture and the argument over uh, terrorism. People compare this to McCarthyism, I would say uh, it's a fairly good uh, comparison. But the fact is that embedded in our political system now is an argument about terrorism and torture in which torture has taken on a very different role. Uh, the Republican Party at this point has a fairly unambiguous position on torture, which is that they support it. They call it extreme interrogation techniques, EITs, but uh, they very much believe that this should be used on terrorist suspects. They're angry and attacked the Obama administration uh, for not having uh, used these techniques on the so-called Christmas bomber, the underwear bomber, as other people call him. Um, and, uh, you know, torture has become a kind of badge of commitment do you have the determination to protect the country? Are you willing to do whatever it takes uh, to shelter Americans from terrorists? And if you're not, uh, you're essentially in favor of coddling terrorists. It's become a permanent part of our political discourse. Let me uh, just tell you a little bit about what I'm talking about when I talk about torture. Um, I want to read, I, last spring, uh, I published a document, the Red Cross Report, which was essentially an interview with 14 high-value detainees, HVDs, people who'd been uh, arrested mostly in Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, captured, I should say, not arrested, uh, and taken to uh, the black sites I mentioned, which were secret prisons that were established in, well, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Thailand, Morocco, Poland, Lithuania, Romania, um, Diego Garcia, there are probably several other w others we don't yet know about, but these were places that were completely secret where these people were uh, taken off to for interrogation. I want to read a little bit uh, about what this kind of interrogation is like, and I'm going to use an excerpt from the Red Cross report that I published last spring. Uh, it's the account of Abu Zubaydah, who was uh, the first of the so-called big fish, high-value detainees. He was captured in Pakistan in March, uh, uh, 2002, uh, so six, not even six months after 9-11. Um, he was, he tried to escape, uh, he was shot three times, uh, bled very badly, went into a coma. Uh, the CIA and the Pakistanis who, who grabbed him thought he was going to die. They secretly shipped over from Baltimore an American trauma surgeon who stitched him up. He went into a coma. And the account I'm going to read is him basically waking up uh, from this coma. He's the first on whom these techniques in aggregate were tried, one after the other. Uh, this is Abu Zubaydah, 33 years old, um, of Saudi and, and Palestinian descent. Uh, I woke up naked, strapped to a bed in a very white room. The room measured approximately 13 feet by 13 feet. The room had three solid walls with a fourth wall consisting of metal bars separating it from a larger room. I'm not sure how long I remained in the bed. After some time, I think it was several days, but can't remember exactly, I was transferred to a chair where I was kept shackled by the hands and feet for what I think was the next two to three weeks. During this time, I developed blisters on the underside of my legs due to the constant sitting. I was only allowed to get up from the chair to go to the toilet, which consisted of a bucket. 
Water for cleaning myself was provided in a plastic bottle. I was given no solid food during the first two to three weeks while sitting on the chair. I was only given Insure, which is a kind of uh, canned nutrient drink, and water to drink. At first, the Insure made me vomit, but this became less with time. Um, it should be said here he had no idea where he was, where exactly you know, this white room was located. The cell and room were air conditioned and were very cold. Very loud shouting type music was constantly playing. It kept repeating about every 15 minutes, 24 hours a day. Sometimes the music stopped and was replaced by a loud hissing or crackling noise. Um, now, what we're seeing here is a series of so-called protocols. Uh, this is the conditioning phase of the interrogation. He's kept naked. Uh, uh, the technical name for this for the interrogators is adjustment of clothing, clothing to induce stress. Uh, the room is kept extremely cold, probably in the 50s, low 50s uh, Fahrenheit. All of this is specified in the CIA documents. Uh, in fact, there's an agent who's detailed basically to watch him and make sure he doesn't turn blue, because uh, blue indicates hypothermia. Um, use of noise to induce stress, that's the constantly playing music. All of this, of course, together is supposed to uh, result in, among other things, sleep deprivation. The, the final uh, attribute here is a stress position, and when it comes to Abu Zubaydah, we're talking about long-term long sitting. So for three weeks or possibly more, he's kept shackled in precisely the same position, you know, day and night, constantly. Uh, after Abu Zubaydah, who was the first of these main guys, uh, they switched to long-term standing, in which they shackled uh, prisoners with their wrists shackled to the ceiling, their feet shackled to the floor. And again, they're naked, they're in a very cold room, and they're kept like this for several weeks. And if you want to feel what that's like, you know, put your hands over your head for five minutes. Um, so that's uh, a stress position, quote unquote, in the euphemistic, uh, um, in the euphemistic language. Um, the CIA protocol uh, describes this: the HVD high-value detainee is placed in the vertical shackling position to begin sleep deprivation. Other shackling procedures may be used during interrogation. The detainee is diapered for sanitary uh, purposes, so they don't he don't, doesn't have to you know, be released to sit on the bucket or what, whatever, although the diaper is not used at all times. And indeed, they frequently took this off, so they had to urinate and defecate on one another. Then they would throw water, or on themselves, sorry, and then they would throw water on them. Um, okay. Um, well, just a word about the standing stress position. This is Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who we've heard a lot about, who was supposed to be tried in New York. Now it is unclear where he's going to be tried. Uh, I was kept for one month in the cell in the standing position with my hands cuffed and shackled above my head and my feet cuffed and shackled to a point in the floor. Of course, during this month, I fell asleep on some occasions while still being held in this position. This resulted in all my weight being applied to the handcuffs around my wrist, resulting in open and bleeding wounds. Both my feet became very swollen after one month of almost continual standing. The person who took the testimony remarks at this point that indeed there, are, there is significant scarring on his wrist and on his ankles. Um, now, it's important to remember that long-term standing, it seems like a very simple, well, okay, keep him standing. Uh, but one thing about torture is very simple techniques are extremely effective. This was a Soviet technique, which the CIA studied. The Soviets called it stoika, simply stoika. And, um, it has, after uh, a couple of hours, extremely dramatic physical effects. The CIA report on it uh, from the late 60s, I'll just read a sentence. After 18 to 24 hours of continuous standing, there is an accumulation of fluid in the legs. Th this dependent edema is produced by the extravasation of fluid from the blood vessels. In other words, water is coming out all kinds of fluid is coming out of, uh, of the arteries. The ankles and feet of the prisoner swell to twice their normal circumference. The adena may rise up to the legs as high as the middle of the thighs. The skin becomes tense and intense, intensely painful. Large blisters develop which break and exude watery serum. So um, one of, for this reason, you had uh, frequently a doctor coming in while uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was holding, was standing with his hands uh, shackled to the ceiling, who would use a tape measure on his legs to see how much they had, they had swollen. 
Um, okay, let me, let me continue for a minute with Abu Zubaydah, our first uh, detainee. Uh, this is several weeks later after the first phase, which is called the conditioning phase. Um, two black wooden boxes were brought into the room outside my cell. Remember, the cell is three walls and then there are bars. Okay, this, um, uh, one of these wooden boxes was tall, slightly higher than me, and narrow, measuring perhaps an area of three and a half by two and a half by six and a half feet in height. So it's like a standing coffin, basically. Uh, the other was shorter, perhaps only three and a half feet in height. So a box like this. Uh, I was taken out of my cell. One of the interrogators wrapped a towel around my neck. They then used it to swing me around and smash me repeatedly against the hard walls of the room. I was also repeatedly slapped in the face. I was then put into the tall black box for what I think was about one and a half to two hours. The box was totally black on the inside as well as the outside. They put a cloth or cover over the outside of the box to cut out all light and restrict my air supply. It was difficult to breathe. When I was let out of the box, I saw that one of the walls of the room had been covered with plywood sheeting. From now on, it was against this wall that I was smashed with a towel around my neck. I think the plywood was put there to provide some absorption of the impact of my body. The interrogators realized that smashing me against the hard wall would probably quickly result in physical injury. Um, that plywood I've thought a lot about, and one can say a couple of things about it. One is that the problem of torture is how do you keep, how do you inflict enough pain while keeping the person who's being interrogated healthy enough to be interrogated? You don't want to cause permanent or disabling injury. Uh, so w when he was walled, this is called walling, uh, that is towel placed around the neck, smashed repeatedly against the wall, uh, clearly the interrogators saw that they might break a bone. It's important to remember that each of these procedures, wherever they were happening, and it's probably Thailand, we don't know for sure, as he didn't know, uh, each of these procedures were approved specifically uh, by at least the director, uh, deputy director level of the CIA. So you had constant back and forth by email, by cable, uh, saying, can we do this, can we do that, can we wall him? And I, though I don't have the documents to prove it, I have a suspicion that after they tried walling the first time, which is something that the Israelis used to use as well, and which gradually developed over the course of these interrogations, eventually the towel was replaced by a leather collar, which actually had handles that the interrogators could use to smash them. Um, the first time they used it, I have a hunch that the interrogators thought, God, we're going to break this guy's arm or break his leg. They wrote back to headquarters and they were told to do something to dampen the effect, and they put the plywood up. Um, the other thing to remember here is that not only were these things approved specifically at the top level of the CIA, but the director at the time, George Tennant, we're talking about 2002 here, would travel sometimes several times a day to the White House uh, to brief the Principals Committee uh, on what was going on in these interrogations. And the Principals Committee is Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, National Security Advisor, Attorney General. Uh, vice president, sometimes the president. So when we talk about torture and prosecutions and things like that, investigations, it's important to remember that this stuff happened and responsibility was spread fairly wi widely at the top levels of the government. I think for specific reasons. Uh, I think the CIA was quite determined that at a time when this stuff is exposed, and they knew it would be exposed, that they were not going to be the ones holding the bag or to use a child's uh, game analogy, they're not going to be the ones without a chair when the music stopped. So they made sure not only that the Department of Justice approved these techniques specifically, they also made sure that while they were going on, uh, people at the top levels knew about them. Even when, by the way, they didn't want to. Uh, John Ashcroft, then the Attorney General, is quoted in one of these meetings uh, saying, uh, we shouldn't be talking about this in the White House. History will not deal kindly with this. Um, all right. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, so let me just read the last section here from what, uh, what happened. And um, uh, All right, the box. Um, well... Let me skip the rest of the box. Uh, the point is he started to bleed from these wounds. Um, uh, oh, all right. 
I should say that there is, for those who are, of you who are interested in the subject, there's an awful lot of material available um, uh, about these interrogations. Uh, and it's been confirmed by other accounts. I mean, it's, okay, the last from Abu Zubaydah. They placed a cloth or cover over the box to cut out the light and restrict my air supply. As it was not high enough to sit upright, I had to crouch down. This is the three and a half foot box. It was very difficult because of my wounds. The stress on my legs held in this position meant my wounds both in the leg and stomach became very painful. I think this occurred about three months after my last operation. It was always cold in the room, but when the cover was placed over the box, it made it hot and sweaty. The wound on my legs began to open and started to bleed. I don't know how long I remained in the small box. I think I may have slept or maybe fainted. Um, I was then dragged from the small box, unable to walk properly, and put on what looked like a hospital bed and strapped down very tightly with belts. There was a belt across his chest, ankles, wrists. A black cloth was then placed over my face, and the interrogators used a mineral bottle to pour water on the cloth so that I could not breathe. After a few minutes, the cloth was removed, and the bed was rotated into an upright position. So this is a sort of a hospital gurney that can go all the way down, all the way up to vertical or horizontal. The pressure of the straps on my wounds was very painful. I vomited. The bed was then again lowered to a horizontal position, and the same torture carried out again with the black cloth over my face and water poured on from the bottle. On this occasion, my head was in a more backward, downwards position. Remember, this is the first time this is being used. And the water was poured on for a longer time. So his head is down like this, feet up like that, strapped. Uh, and he's naked, of course, uh, the whole, this whole time. I struggled against the straps, trying to breathe, but it was hopeless. I thought I was going to die. I lost control of my urine. Since then, I still lose control of my urine when under stress. I was then placed again in the tall box. While I was inside the box, loud music was played again, and someone kept banging repeatedly on the box from the outside. I tried to sit down on the floor, but because of the small space, the bucket of urine tipped over and spilled over me. I was then taken out again. The towel was wrapped around my neck, and I was smashed into the wall with a plywood covering and repeatedly slapped in the face by the same two interrogators. I was then made to sit on the floor with a black hood over my head until the next session began. The room was always kept very cold. This went on for approximately a week. During this time, the whole procedure was repeated five times. On each occasion, apart from one, I was suffocated once or twice, he means the waterboarding on the hospital bed, and was put in the vertical position on the bed in between. On one occasion, the suffocation was repeated three times. I vomited each time I was put in the vertical position between suffocations, during that week, I was not given any solid food. Obviously, they didn't want to lose him when he uh, vomited, which is a part of this procedure. I collapsed and lost consciousness on several occasions. Eventually, the torture was stopped by the intervention of a doctor. I was told during this period that I was one of the first to receive these interrogation techniques, so no rules applied. It felt like they were experimenting and trying out techniques to be used later on other people. That is, in fact, true. We see during the course of the various accounts of these interrogations how these techniques evolve. I mentioned the uh, towel, which became a leather cover and then a leather uh, collar and then a plastic collar that was developed specifically for walling prisoners. Uh, the waterboarding technique, which we've just looked at, evolved more and uh, came to involve, among other things, an oximeter placed on the uh, prisoner's finger or thumb so as to constantly monitor vital signs. So again, uh, to not lose the prisoner, to not have him die uh, under interrogation. Um, so we can see, if you look at these documents, an evolution of what happens. Now it should be said, he says, I'm the first, they were experimenting on me. It should be said, these are very, what I've described to you are very old techniques. They go back centuries, literally. Waterboarding goes back at least to the Inquisition, and depending on how you define it, probably uh, farther. Uh, the French used it in Algeria. They would generally strap a prisoner, you know, they beat him up as here, uh, strap, you know, naked, strap him down, usually uh, on his back uh, to a bench of some kind, lift the bench up and submerge his head in a bucket of liquid, uh, sometimes uh, dirty water, soapy water, urine sometimes. The, the point is to have it go back uh, into the lungs, basically, and it produces a choking, um, uh, drowning sensation. The press, in describing this, you know, the boilerplate is often simulated drowning, they call waterboarding, but there's nothing really simulated about it. it, it it's drowning. Uh, you could call it really uh, interrupted drowning. Um, 
anyway, we see uh, a steady progression of these uh, techniques, a development of them. Um, they were used on hundreds of people. We don't know how many specifically, but certainly the numbers in the hundreds. They were used across the government. I've been reading uh, from accounts of the CIA, which are kind of the purest, as it were, version. Uh, but the Department of Defense used them in Guantanamo, uh, Mr. Katani, among others, um, uh, and various other parts of the government uh, did as well. Uh, so um, why talk about them now? Well, uh, as you know, when President Obama took office, uh, the second full day of his presidency, he uh, signed three executive orders. Among other things, they stopped these specific techniques and limited uh, what the CIA could do to what is included in the Army Field Manual, a field manual that was reissued in 2006 to specifically prohibit uh, most of what I've just described to you, although there's a very significant loophole in that, which I don't really have time to get into. Uh, but he did indeed declare that this would stop. He uh, declared also that uh, the government would do a study on proper interrogation. And finally, he declared that Guantanamo uh, would be closed within a year. Uh, as we all know, Guantanamo has not been closed. And indeed, it's unclear when it might be. Uh, Greg Craig, who was the official, the, the uh, Obama's White House counsel, the official most closely associated with this policy, uh, has lost his job, uh, probably due to his advocacy of this. And we've seen uh, during uh, the past year a remarkable phenomenon, which is a pushback on the part of uh, Republicans in general, but especially the former vice president, uh, in a kind of unprecedented, um, I, I just don't know anything in American history that uh, uh, that is like it, within 10 days of Vice President Cheney leaving office and Obama assuming the presidency, the former vice president was out criticizing the administration for having renounced torture. Um, I'm going to read a quote from him. This is 10 days after uh, he left office uh, on, I think this is on Fox television. When we, this is Cheney, when we get people who are more concerned about reading the rights to an Al Qaeda terrorist than they are with protecting the United States against people who are absolutely committed to do anything they can to kill Americans, then I worry. These are evil people. We're not going to win this fight by turning the other cheek. If it hadn't been for what we did with respect to the enhanced interrogation techniques for high-value detainees, then we would have been attacked again. These policies we put in place, in my opinion, were absolutely crucial to getting us through the last seven-plus years without a major casualty attack on the United States. And he has made these uh, uh, sorts of statements repeatedly, uh, and they have become more and more uh, truculent, uh, more and more aggressive, uh, until you reach the point uh, where he talks about where the terror, this is a couple months later, last spring, where the terrorists are arms, armed with, uh, he warned of an attack where the terrorists are armed with something much more dangerous, I'm quoting, than an airline ticket and a box cutter a nuclear weapon and a biological weapon of some kind. That's the one that would involve the deaths of perhaps hundreds of thousands of people and the one you have to spend a hell of a lot of time guarding against. I think there's a high probability of such an attempt. The vice president went on. Whether or not they can pull it off depends on whether or not we keep in place policies that have allowed us to, def to defeat all further attempts since 9-11 to launch mass casualty attacks against the United States. If you release hardcore Al Qaeda terrorists who are held in Guantanamo, I think they go back into the business of trying to kill more Americans and mount further mass casualty attacks. If you turn them loose and they go kill more Americans, who is responsible for that? Asked the former vice president. Who indeed? Uh, these statements have been extremely effective, I would argue, in pushing the Republican Party to see the political uh, gains to be made um, uh, by using that most lucrative of political emotions, uh, fear. Uh, and they have done it uh, extremely well, so that by now, a year after 9-11, we've seen major attack on the administration over the so-called underwear bomber. Uh, and we've seen a general development of uh, the idea of torture as necessary to protect the United States. And in fact, it seems to me, if we get back to stripping bare the body here for a minute, and the body we're stripping bare is our own country and our own values, that one of the 
the most egregious results of 9-11 has been the belief on apparently a majority of the population that this country cannot be kept safe if the government follows the law. Um, the figures now on torture among Americans, on the feelings about torture among Americans, uh, are quite striking. Uh, the most recent Pew poll, uh, if you look at the numbers simply of those people in various countries who say, who will say yes to the question, the government should never torture detainees. That's the question you ask, and you say, do you agree with that? Uh, in uh, Egypt, for example, 53% say yes, the government should never torture detainees. In Iran, 56% say yes, the government should never torture detainees. Um, Palestinian territory, 66%, two out of three. M Europe, roughly, depending on which country, around 80%. So four out of five say the government should never torture detainees. Americans, does anybody want to guess? Very good. That's precisely right. 25% of Americans say the government should never torture detainees. And I would argue to you that this does not define a difference between Americans and all other peoples. It basically is a product of the rhetoric that we have seen coming out first from the Bush administration. Anything? I've answered all your questions, eh? <laughs> Thank you for coming. Uh, one of the things I'm interested in is how did the idea of not trying the terrorist in a civilian court, um, why is that such an issue now? Because mm -hmm. I know that under um, Bush they did try a lot of terrorists in um, civilian courts, and so why is it such an issue now? That's a, that's a great question, actually. Um, you know, after 9-11, uh, the Bush administration uh, put together a strategy that was very much based on defining the war on terror as a war. And in part, there was a political motive for this, uh, a couple of political motives. One was to separate them from the Clinton administration. You know, they never declared war. They never were, took this seriously, which in a, in a sense could combat the notion that the Bush administration had let the country be attacked. I mean, they were politically vulnerable. They were aggressive about it. Also, defining it as a war allowed the president uh, to increase his power to the utmost degree. You know, we're now in a war. We're now in a crisis. I can wiretap. I can uh, interrogate beyond the bounds of the law. I can uh, imprison 5,000 uh, uh, immigrants in the U.S., you know, on my own authority. Uh, so they had this interest in doing it this way. And the military commission's idea was a part of that. The problem was the Supreme Court knocked it down several times. Uh, uh, Congress then reinstated it, went back and forth. But, but your question was very intelligently posed because it is true that during this whole time, the civilian courts continued prosecuting terrorists very effectively, by the way. The military commissions, because of all these problems with how they were defined, I think they, at the end of the day, prosecuted three. I believe that's the right number. Civilian courts, hundreds. Um, why has it become a, great, a big issue now? Because I think it fits into this general political motive that I tried to define that the Republicans have, which is to be aggressive on the war on terror, to say that the Obama administration doesn't take it seriously, doesn't believe it's a war, and of course trying terrorists in civilian courts fits into that perfectly. You know, why aren't they using military commissions? Why did they read the Miranda rights to, uh, uh, to the so-called underwear bomber, right? 
Uh, how could they do that? And this fits also, it should be observed, I think, into the general Republican rhetoric about tough on crime. I mean, there's a, this dovetails very well with a kind of domestic rhetoric of Miranda rights, coddling prisoners, coddling criminals. So it fits very well in, into Republican uh, terminology and Republican politics. Can you clarify who all is affected by these policies? Because um, as you mentioned, when Cheney gets on TV or, or one of these extremely anti-terrorist people or whatever get on TV, they say, if we can't interrogate the, the, the terrorists, the Al-Qaeda people, then we're going to lose the war. But in fact, in implementing these policies, it seems that it certainly doesn't only affect the Al-Qaeda terrorists. Uh, the, the, if for some reason I was misidentified as a terrorist, they could come and pick me up. Mm -hmm. So uh, can you clarify um, who all is affected, what percentage of the population could in theory be interrogated and so on? Well, again, that's a really good question. Uh, it should be said, I think, first of all, that you know there are about 150, I think, or 160 prisoners still in Guantanamo. But at one time, there were 800. And most of those people have simply been released. Some of them released to foreign governments, and they're in jail. But most of them simply released, because certainly the majority of those prisoners should not have been there. They were handed over to American forces in part because the Americans offered a bounty of $1,000 on up for any you know, terrorist who was captured and handed over to them. So hundreds of people uh, were handed over to them. And the, the Bush administration knew quite early on that most of those people didn't belong in Guantanamo. Uh, but the political costs of releasing them were quite high, and it was much easier to keep them, which is a horrible thing, but it's documented and, and, uh, and true. And I write about this a little bit in my book. Um, they actually developed a so-called mosaic theory of information whereby it didn't matter if they were terrorists. If we can get enough information from them, we can put all of this into a mosaic and still learn about, about terrorism. I mean, this was a, a, actually a remarkable uh, uh, thing whereby basically the idea of having to arrest only terrorists was kind of defined out of, out of existence. Um, so. Uh, we also have on the rendition side, which is something I mentioned earlier, you know, this kind of snatching people, kidnapping them, taking them to the black sites, uh, a number of very highly publicized cases. The most highly publicized is Maher Arar, who was a Canadian citizen of Syrian descent, who was grabbed on a flight uh, to Europe at Kennedy Airport, uh, whisked away to Syria, where he was tortured for a year. I mean, in very horrible ways. Um, and it was a complete mistake. I mean, it, it was just a mistake. They, they had a different person that, you know, um, the Canadian government, to its great credit, did a full investigation of this. The report, again, you can find very easily. Uh, it's quite thorough and fascinating. The American government, on the other hand, has never admitted that's a mistake. Uh, or in the case of any of these other prisoners. Uh, so I think you're right. And the broader point that needs to be made here, when you don't have due process, mistakes get made and are not corrected. I mean, mistakes are made all the time, but if you have an adversary process, if you have courts, if you have lawyers, they can be corrected because someone is there arguing. But if you're just throwing someone into a dungeon, which in effect you are here, there is no adversary process. And indeed, even when you find out what's wrong, you know, that this person shouldn't be there, there's no incentive to fix it. Uh, in fact, there's a disincentive because it's embarrassing. Uh, the other thing, finally, that should be said is that one of the things that happened, this happened in Iraq, which I saw, you know, at Abu Ghraib, for example, they arrested so many people. You know, they did these sweeps in the early days of the insurgency when the U.S. had no good intelligence on what was going on. They would just cordon off a neighborhood and smash, break down doors and arrest every young man they could find. Uh, you know, no evidence. They would just take them. These, these combat units would just take them. I mean, this is, again, a documented fact. They'd be sent to Abu Ghraib. So Abu Ghraib, at a certain point, had 15, 18, 20,000 prisoners, 90% of whom, and that figure comes from the intelligence agencies, should not have been there. And one of the things it did was break down the intelligence process. The interrogators had so many people to interview and were wasting their time so much and could not release them because the combat units who had a say in who was released resisted it, that you had a completely dysfunctional system. Uh, so in practical terms, uh, it also screwed things up very well, not just in justice terms. Um, so who does it affect? I mean, it affected a lot of people it shouldn't have affected, no question about it. Yes? 
Hi, I, I'm not sure where to start. Uh, <laughs> I've had outrage fatigue for eight years. Yeah, well, and, I know the and, feeling, believe but me. But unfortunately, <laughs> it hasn't abated. And, and I don't, I, I'm trying to ask this in a constructive way. Yeah. Like what, what do you think we could actually fix that would make a difference? And the, the thing that comes to me is just the unreality, the, the turning unreality into policy. And I don't know, I mean, you know, there's like Dirty Harry who, who gets people angry because somebody, some criminal didn't get it rid of Miranda rights. And then there's Scalia, you know, quoting 24, saying this is, you know, turning into reality. And then just general Fox News, they're just complete non-reality. I mean, how mm -hmm. would it return to the fairness doctrine help? I mean, what, what's, how do now you, you're how depressing do you me. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, first of all, thanks for bringing up Dirty Harry. I often raise uh, Dirty Harry and N24, which I think is its uh, spawn in a way, um, uh, because these do put forward a kind of ideology, which is that, you know, liberals with their red tape and all this law crap, they're going to get you killed. And what we need is some tough men to, you know, cut through that and protect the country. And, you know, with Dirty Harry, he's, of course, it's in San Francisco, of course, and it's uh, uh, Clint Eastwood is a, a rogue cop. That is, his superiors want to punish him, and he cuts through it all. And he still he tortures uh, the murder, the uh, serial killer on the uh, fifty yard line of Kizar Stadium, as I recall. It's still a remarkable movie. Um, but he's a rogue cop in the system. The interesting change with Twenty Four is that Kiefer Sutherland, the character Jack Bauer, is a um, uh, employed directly by the White House, by the president. You know, the unit or whatever it is, is um, uh, a direct um, emanation of the White House itself uh, circumventing all the, the red tape and so on. And apparently this idea, and this is why it works politically, of, uh, you know, when the population is fearful, and this rhetoric creates fear first, you create it, they're about to do another mass casualty attack, and then you respond with the answer, which is we have to be tough as nails. We have to cut through all this stupid law stuff and do whatever is necessary. And that notion of untrammeled power protecting you is apparently a very, for many people, a very calming uh, notion. Um, when you get to the qu your question, which is about what to do about it, I, I'm, as I say, you were starting to depress me in talking about the fairness doctrine. I, I think it, it is true uh, that the uh, deterioration and the quality of, of uh, television news in particular makes this kind of rhetoric more effective. You know, you have Fox, you know, yelling and yelling about it. And you also, by the way, it should be say, said, have CNN and MSNBC, in which people are shouting back and forth at one another about it. You know, th there's much less reporting, much more uh, just yelling back and forth, you know, so-called commentators. So television has become, political debate on television has become a kind of blood sport, and when it becomes that sort of blood sport, it's much easier to use TV to incite fear. I mean, television isn't very good at conveying information. It's great at provoking emotion, uh, which is why, you know, the healthcare debate, you know, who knows what, what the healthcare plan is? Nobody knows if you talk to people. And if you watch TV, well, somebody can be a news junkie, but they'll never have it defined because television isn't good at conveying that sort of thing. Whether the fairness doctrine, I, I think the return of, of regulation of television in the form of the fairness doctrine and other things that, of course, was the entire history from the 30s with radio all the way to the Reagan administration, uh, I think that would help, uh, certainly. Uh, so the news divisions don't have to feel that they uh, have to make money. I mean, they used to be lost leaders. They used to do a much better job. But we're way beyond that, I'm afraid, unfortunately. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for coming and uh, sharing this information with us. Um, thank you. A, uh, a couple of uh, questions. One is uh, you had mentioned the stat about 25% of Americans being opposed to, to torture. Um, but 75% of the U.S. is not Republican. So I was wondering if you could kind of comment on that, like just how, like who are those people basically? <laughs> um, and then, and why, why are they okay with it? Um, and the other is that uh, growing up, uh, I always had this, this perception of the United States as kind of being the ones who take their high road. Now, I know that's not entirely true, but that was my perception right. that like, it was like what set us apart from a lot of other countries were issues like torture and so forth. So I was wondering if you could comment on children growing up nowadays where 
they're sort of inundated with this idea that actually torture is kind of justified, maybe, mm -hmm. which is absolutely foreign to what I grew up with. Yeah. Um, the, well, these are all hard questions. Those are two, two I think, extremely uh, good questions. You're right. 75% of the country is not Republican. And, you know, what is, I think, most important here is, uh, and you see this at the level of the Congress as well, that significant parts of the Democratic Party uh, are afraid of this issue. Or, you know, to give them more credit, feel strongly about it, uh, that these things should be used on detainees. And I think that's reflected in the population. It should be said, by the way, that that poll was government should never torture. So never, uh, which, you know, uh, you can imagine people answering it um, in the negative by saying, well, we need to have this as a possible uh, uh, option if the so-called ticking bomb scenario happens, which 24 is, of course, based on which we have, so far as I know, never encountered, but which as a rhetorical device is extremely useful to say, what if there was a nuke, it was planted in the middle of Manhattan or San Francisco or whatever, you had the guy who knew where it was, you knew it was gonna go off in three minutes, you, you know, all of these things which are completely ridiculous, but which have this way of narrowing down the question to a, a, a tiny point. Um, but you're quite right that it isn't just the Republican Party. It's very true. Um, your second question about the belief in America taking the high road, you know, I think cuts to the heart of a lot of things, and it makes me, you know, uh, sort of quail for a second, because, um, you know, there is, is this notion, and we do grow up with it, the United States, I mean, it's, it's not just, we grow up with it, it's part of our founding ideology, that the U.S. Uh, is different. It was founded in a different way, it was founded on ideals of equality of all people, uh, equality of all men, actually, but to be specific, but, uh, but it was, you know, and of course, even at the time, this ideology was not put in practice when it came to voting, when it came to a lot of things. Um, but nonetheless, that's what the country is founded on. And there goes along with that, I think, that conviction, uh, the idea that, you know, we're always the nice guys. You know, we, you know, we rebuilt Europe. We didn't just rape it and take what we wanted. We rebuilt it. We're a country that, you know, we're not, we don't go out and grab what we want, even though we could. We're all powerful, but we're nice. And with that general ideology of, you know, we're above it all, which is basically what you're saying, goes a notion as well that uh, no more Mr. Nice Guy. Do you know what I mean? That when we're attacked, and I, I saw this frequently after 9-11, this idea that, all right, you want to play that way? We can play that way. We can be as tough as anyone. I remember I did a debate uh, shortly before the Iraq war began with Christopher Hitchens in, in Berkeley. Uh, I was arguing against the war. He was uh, arguing for it. It was January 2003, so a couple months before the war, and it packed hall, several thousand people. And I'll never forget, and this is Berkeley, I'll never forget at a certain point Christopher said, you know, at the end of the day, we've been attacked and we have to respond, which of course, you know, elided the fact that uh, you know, Saddam did not attack us, but and nonetheless, that's what he said. And I remember up on the stage feeling this sort of surge from the audience, kind of the middle of the audience was just kind of like a lot of frat guys and, you know, sort of athletes, you'll forgive me, but that's kind of what it looked like from the stage. And I felt this, I heard this kind of in, in reaction, you know, yeah. And I remember thinking, you know, it's very, this sort of primal thing that, hey, we've been nice, we don't drop our nukes even though we have them, but you know what, now it's time to get tough. And I, so I think that that way of thinking has its roots in the general way of thinking you're saying, which is we're the nice guys, we're above it all. And it, it has a kind of slingshot effect, which is that, all right, now we're gonna get tough and dirty and we can do it as well as anyone. And I think that in a sense was the governing ideology for a number of years and it's still strong on the part of many people. Yeah. I Hi. So um, I would say that on the moral issue of whether torture is ever okay, it's completely legitimate to say it should never be done. But on the pragmatic issue of whether it actually uh, works, it seems that uh, Obama, more than anyone else, was would have been the guy to come into the White House and say, we're going to end this. And even he has sort of backed down a little bit from that, uh, both in rhetoric and, and action. Um, so. Don't you think that it's possible that 
he has sort of seen the information on, on whether it's been effective and, and reassessed on the pragmatic issue that basically... I'm sorry, reassessed, re I missed what uh, you just said. And, and reassessed his position in, uh, in pragmatic terms and said basically with t torture we have this dilemma in that we have to trade off the public good and the individual protections. Mm -hmm. um, and given the new information that I have, I'm now leaning a little bit more in the public safety, public good uh, direction. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a very good question, first of all. Uh, and it, as to whether I believe that that's what's happened, uh, the answer is no, I don't. I think there's no evidence of that, whatever. Um, the premise, of course, is that in the whole metaphor of balancing the public good and, and following the law or moral, whatever, however you'd like to define the anti-torture position, um, the premise of that, of course, is that uh, torture is the only way to get information under certain circumstances, that it is indeed effective. And I think all evidence shows, or at least suggests, that Obama does not believe that. Um, it's clear that former Vice President Cheney does believe it uh, fervently. And one can't just say, as many writers I admire do, well, torture doesn't work. Um, I think there is, to some degree, an open question on that. I mean, some interrogators believe uh, it does work. An awful lot believe it doesn't, that it just gives bad information, that it makes it harder to get information. Um, I think if you took a consensus of sort of professionals who do interrogation, the overwhelming majority would say this stuff doesn't work. It's a bad idea. However. Um, to be honest, there's no way to judge. You know, the, the vice president continually says, we would have been attacked, we would have been attacked. If you look at the evidence he's given to date, it's very, very thin. Uh, he, he continually says, I have secret documents, you know, that will prove this, but alas, they're classified. M my view is, that I had hoped that the Obama administration would essentially appoint, boring as it sounds, a high-level commission like the 9-11 Commission for all of its flaws, uh, to investigate this thoroughly, to look at what was done, what information was actually gained, and to weigh that against the damage that this stuff did to the country. Because, you know, the war, and this is, it, what, what you weigh against torture is not just that it's immoral, or not just that it's illegal, which, by the way, it is, uh, but the political damage you do to yourself. Uh, Obama has talked about this frequently, was particularly in the context of closing Guantanamo. That, and I saw this myself in Iraq, that Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo became huge issues throughout the Muslim world. I mean, you see on murals on the street, you know, hooded man, you know, on the box with the wires, leashed man, you know, Lindy England holding the leashed with the naked uh, Iraqi prisoner on the ground, sort of, you know, scrunched with his face, scrunched in agony. Uh, these things are extremely vivid issues in what is, at the end of the day, a political war. I mean, we're not going to win this war by killing all jihadists. What eventually has to happen is that the political impetus for joining these groups or supporting these groups has to be diminished largely through political means. And Obama, I think to his great credit, realizes that. That's why he went to Cairo. And that is, I think, one of the main reasons he's been quite outspoken about torture. I mean, he mentions it repeatedly. Uh, it's just when it comes to the policy side that his administration, it seems to me, is starting to hesitate about whether it's worth it to push these things all the way. But I, to, to go back to your question, I see no evidence uh, that he is determined that this stuff is useful. I mean, he hasn't reinstituted the policies, um, so. Can, can I follow that up with two sure. comments, questions? Um, yeah. So one of them is, I think that if someone full-heartedly believed that torture would absolutely save a thousand lives or 10,000 lives, I think they would still, for most people, have a big moral issue with doing it. So my question is, if it doesn't work, and if the people who are participating in it are not seeing any results, why is this still a discussion that's being had? And no, no, no. Well, let, me, let me just jump yeah. in there quickly. I, I'm certainly not arguing that everyone who used it didn't believe it worked. Uh, you know, there are certainly people who believe it worked. There's no question about that, and one shouldn't be you know, ambivalent about answering that. Uh, there are, and it's not just the vice president. There were other people who believed it worked. It should be said also that some people involved in the interrogations, uh, including some who have come out publicly, believe that it was a terrible mistake. So, you know, but I would never stand here and say everybody who was involved in this thinks it's a waste of time and they shouldn't do it. I, I didn't, would not argue that. Otherwise, you know, if that were true, we wouldn't really be having this discussion. Okay. And, and on this, the, you made a point about trying to end terrorism with 
politics and that sort of thing. Um, I, I, that I, I really think I disagree with you because... I didn't say end. Oh, well, well, I said so, diminish. Right. So my point is, like, the, the speech that Obama made in Cairo was very good. And to the best of my knowledge, there's no evidence that anything has changed in terms of the Islamic world. It is one point. And the, the other point on something like Abu Ghraib, obviously that was a disgusting thing. Uh, I don't know the details about how much the higher levels knew about it. But it seems to me that it, a lot of the Islamic world, the people that get motivated to go out and blow themselves up, they believe, for instance, that the Jews were responsible for 9-11, um, that Israel, it's very widely believed that Israel wants to be the, I, I, don't, I, rem I don't remember the term, but that huge big country that's 10 times bigger than Israel is now, is what many of them believe it, it, Israel seeks to become. Things right. that are not based on any evidence. Yeah. So uh, this is just that their culture is not one that values truth as much as it should. Uh, and so they are very easy to, they become vulnerable to all kinds of propaganda. And we, to the best of my knowledge, even the Bush administration and Dick Cheney were opposed to what happened with Abu Ghraib. Um, <laughs> well, okay, let me, let me jump in there because you, you raise a lot of points. Um, the first point was about the effect of Obama's speech. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't say his speech would end terrorism or, or anything else. It's obvious that terrorism will continue. There will be more terrorism because there was terrorism before 9-11. I mean, you know, it's not going to go away. Uh, it's, a, it's, we've, it's been with us for centuries, literally. Uh, it's very effective in some ways. Um, but I would completely disagree with you when you say that uh, there's no evidence that his speech had any effect. Uh, public opinion polls in much of the uh, Muslim world uh, show that the sort of catastrophic fall in the opinion of the United States has certainly been reversed since Obama has become president. Um, uh, you know, I think the question is, what would you take as evidence for uh, the speech having been effective? And it seems to me incontrovertible uh, that uh, th this war, at the end of the day, has political sources. I mean, you pointed to a lot of them yourself in the second part of your question, uh, which has to do with attitudes about the United States. You know, these are real things that people believe, and it, it makes no sense to me that uh, in some way changing the behavior and also uh, uh, the rhetoric of the U.S. would have no effect whatever on people's perceptions of the U.S. Uh, and their behavior. Now, will it change everyone's? Of course not. It won't. Uh, you know, the roots of the, the struggle with al-Qaeda, and you can point this out by looking at Obama's speech itself, he talks in Cairo, it was an eloquent speech. Uh, there was, you know, I urge people who, who didn't see it to have a look at it. It's very much worth looking at. But the fact remains that he was standing there in Cairo in the shadow of one of the autocracies that these guys are really jazzed about, these guys meaning al-Qaeda. They want, you know, the Mubarak regime and the House of Saud in Saudi Arabia are the two regimes that they're desperate to get rid of. Why? Because they believe that they're apostate. Uh, they believe they're illegitimate. They believe they should be replaced by Islamic governments. And they look at the United States, and having tried to remove them directly, uh, especially Egypt, and having been crushed by Egypt's security forces, they then turned, that was the near enemy, they then turned to the far enemy, the United States, because the U.S. is perceived as the major backer of the House of Saud and the Mubarak regime, to which one should say the U.S. does give $2 billion a year. So the U.S. is a major backer. Um, so from their point of view, you attack the United States to try to remove these regimes. Now, uh, is there something we can do about that? Well, Obama has not begun to change policy in any way. To, but I would say that this is a political problem that's recognizable. It has to do with political modernization, which is a tendentious term, but I think it's true when it comes to Egypt and, and Saudi Arabia. It comes from a lack of representation in those countries. It comes from the frustration of a very youth-based population, and in the case of Egypt, a highly educated population, in the case of Saudi Arabia, a very rich population, uh, that uh, has great frustrations about not getting jobs, about not having opportunity. Um, a lot of things that, it seems to me, you can trace to not having governments that are in any way representative. I mean, Egypt has been ruled for 30 years under a state of emergency, has a terrible torture regime. Um, so, uh, you know, during the Cold War, the U.S. supported autocracies in Latin America. Very similar. How do you support political modernization without having a communist regime come in? Uh, 
here, how do you support political modernization without having an Islamic regime come in? Because if you had a free election in Egypt or Saudi Arabia, you would probably have an Islamic regime. Uh, and that is a real political problem. So I don't think it just has to do with culture. I don't have to think it has to do with misperceptions. But I do think it has a political answer. And I think this administration knows that uh, and is trying to do something about it, however difficult it is. Hi. Thanks for coming. Um, Thank you. I was wondering, on the topic of the political climate in America, something that I've wondered is at least five or six years ago, one absolutely unequivocal voice that torture by Americans is wrong was John McCain. He's a leading figure in the Republican Party. Right. Why did he never have any influence? <laughs> These are all extremely hard questions. I don't know why I'm looking at Anne, but someone has to be responsible. Um, uh, you're right. McCain had a long history of opposing torture. He was tortured uh, very brutally uh, by the North Vietnamese when he was a prisoner in, in Hanoi. Uh, and that, the, there's a gruesome account of that in his uh, memoir. Um, and uh, in 2004, 2005, uh, 2006, he was involved very directly in uh, trying to mitigate these policies. Uh, and he was involved directly in the Detainee Treatment Act uh, and the Military Commissions Act. And uh, he would claim, I think, that he was responsible for putting a stop to waterboarding, among other things. Um, uh, whether or not that's true, I don't know. But I do remember vividly, I was in Washington uh, to, people remember the Baker Commission, you know, on Iraq. I went there to testify to it. And I remember uh, one, you know, getting up, opening the door, you know, and they have the newspaper waiting for you on the floor there outside your room. And there was the Washington Post. And it had uh, the headline, I wish I could quote it verbatim, but it was, McCain's position on torture made damage nomination hopes. Front page. And, you know, I looked at this and thought, wow, what a headline, you know, and took the paper and read it. And the piece was this amazing piece of journalism in which there was really no news. All it was was people, most of them unnamed, within the Republican Party saying, well, you know, if John keeps after this issue, I don't know whether he can get the nomination. You know, the security hawks are going to be very alienated by this. So the whole thing was kind of a letter to McCain saying, you'd better hold off on this stuff or you're going to have trouble uh, getting the nomination. And I think uh, uh, for political reasons, and indeed, you know, we say that as if it's a curse, he is a politician. Uh, I think he did uh, hold off to some degree on this issue, although it should be said, to be fair to him, in the uh, Republican primary debates, I don't know, God, think of that, I wish I could get those out of my head, but the debates during the primaries leading up to uh, uh, the his getting the Republican nomination, uh, at one point, I don't remember where it was, but uh, Mitt Romney sort of said, we need, you know, close Guantanamo, we need more Guantanamos, we need to, you know, basically more Guantanamo's, more torture. And McCain very aggressively took him on, uh, you know, on television and sort of said, no, this is wrong. You're completely wrong about this. I know about torture. And so he still remained kind of a spokesman on this issue, I think, throughout the campaign. Um, but uh, I, think, I think you're quite right that he hasn't gone against his party on this issue. And I would have real respect for him if he came out against the vice president and criticized him. And he indeed uh, has not done that um, and has not been helpful on the Guantanamo issue either. And I think it, you know, one could speculate on whether he's moving to the right. He has a primary challenge in Arizona from J.D. Hayworth. Uh, and in general, he's perceived to be moving to the right. Um, but the story of McCain, you know, is a very interesting one when it, when it comes to the general issue of torture and politics, which is one of my subjects today, obviously. Thanks. You're welcome. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. It's a pleasure.